Hi, I'm going to start my introduction as people are filtering in here. Um, hello, I'm Jonathan Weinstein, Professor of Economics here at WashU. Um, this event is sponsored by the Economics Department and coordinated um, with help from the Common Reading Team, uh, led by Alexandria Clemens. Uh, many thanks to them um, and to Economics Chair Gatano Antonoffi for um, making this event happen. Um, so many of you have read Kathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Math Destruction, which was the assigned common reading book for this year's freshman class. Um, so you may be familiar with Kathy's unique history. Um, she's been a math professor, a Wall Street font, activist, blogger, consultant, and author. Um, I'll add a brief personal story of how I met Kathy. Um, we're both from Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, when she was in 10th grade and I was in 5th grade, um, I was going to the high school to take math. Uh, Kathy wasn't in my class, but she saw me in the hall and was, was curious about what this uh, small person was doing there. Um, so she came over and introduced herself, um, and she spoke a bit like a character in some adventure game who introduces a stage of the quest. I remember her saying something like, so, you love math? She said, no, no, I mean, do you really love math? Um, so anyway, uh, so we met, we wound up, wound up meeting at the library once a week for a while for her to teach me math, and I learned a lot from that. Um, and, and three things about this story are very uh, quintessential Kathy O'Neill. So one, as a, as a 10th grader, she figured she was the best one in town to teach me math. Um, she had the initiative to, uh, to act on that. And of course, uh, she was right. She was, she was the best person to teach me math at that stage. Um, so we're all very lucky that now she's taken up the task of teaching the world how the tools of mathematical modeling can reshape our society for good or ill. That's the subject of her book. Um, and that's what she's here to speak to us about today. Um, so uh, please welcome. We're very glad to have um, common reading author Kathy O'Neill here. She will give a brief talk, um, followed by a longer question period. Um, so, Kathy, go ahead. Wow. Um, I'm so glad you told that story, because I, I don't remember how it started. I just remember being like, oh, man, I get to talk math with this super smart young guy. Uh, but that's a really sweet um, description of it. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, hopefully, you guys can see this. And I'm um, going to full screen it. Big. OK, cool. So I'm going to, uh, as Jonathan said, I'm going to sort of give a short talk. And it's going to be pretty provocative, um, intentionally leaving out some details so that you could ask questions if you're confused. Um, but I wanted to give you sort of an overview. So. The very, very high level overview is that we are presented with algorithms, predictive algorithms. So what I mean when I say algorithms, an actual algorithm could mean anything like, like a recipe, like addition could be an algorithm. What I mean by, when I say algorithm, I mean predictive. So you're predicting usually a person, usually with a score. And we're presented um, with these things. Um, sometimes it's in the context of artificial intelligence, often, uh, that usually that's just, it's just a marketing term. We're presented as if it's like objective, it's fa fair, it's automatically uh, trustworthy, it's fact. Uh, and high level, it's not. It's I, the way I like to, say, like to say it is that it's an opinion embedded in code. There's a lot of opinion embedded in any algorithm. There's a lot of choices being made, a lot of values that are being laid down by the people who build the algorithm, sometimes unintentionally sometimes quite intentionally. And so um, in the worst case, um, they're, they're, quite, uh, they're quite harmful because, well, partly because they're not very factual, they're not objective, they're not fair, they're destructive, they're problematic. And partly because of that sort of bait and switch that I just mentioned, like that we trust them. We, since we trust them to be fair, we trust them to be objective, we trust them to be fact-based, uh, we give them too much power. Um, and so the main goal of my book was to tell people, yo, don't give big data algorithms this much power because they can really, really backfire. 
And um, another high level way of I want to think I want to convince you to think about it is that for the most part, these are like people using the authority of mathematics and science um, to to talk us out of asking questions. Um, but we actually need to ask questions like we should not be intimidated by this shield of mathematical authority, um, which I think is bogus. It is not math. It is uh, it and it is our right to ask, especially in the context I will be discussing. Um, but before I go on to the examples and many of them are coming from the book, not all of them. Um, I want to tell you exactly a little bit more about what I mean by predictive algorithm and like the example I also give in my book is making dinner for my kids. This is my son who is older than this now, but I love this picture of him with Nutella all over his face um, because he really loves Nutella and he still does, by the way. He would look just like this if I had taken a picture this morning, except a little bit older. Um, the idea here is I want to convince you that we all use algorithms inside our head every single day when we're getting dressed, when we're going to work, when we're doing whatever, we're using a predictive algorithm. We're predicting what will work out for me. Um, and the way, what, what, what do we need in order to make that decision? We need two things. We need memories of like how this kind of thing worked out in the past. That's sort of data, but it's in our head. It's not formal like digitized data in a database, which it would be if you were writing code, but it, it is data, um, it's memories. And then the second thing you need is a definition of success. You need to say like, what do I mean by will this work out? Exactly. You have to be really precise. So when you're getting dressed, your, your precise question is, will I look good? Or on a different day, it'd be like, am I comfortable? Or on a different day, will be, will it be warm enough? Like you, you know, you could try to combine those things um, together to say what success looks like, but you have to have a specific definition of success to decide what is the optimal outfit to wear. Or in my case, you have to have a specific definition of success to decide what dinner to cook. Um, and so for me, the definition of success for dinner when I cook it for my kids is like, did my kids eat vegetables at the end of it? Like that's my definition of success. And the point is that like I optimize to success over time. So like I remember, oh, like, you know, the, this meal led to my kids eating vegetables. This meal led to my kids not eating anything and going hungry. That was not so successful. I will not make more meals like this or this meal, this third meal, they ate a lot, but it was really unhealthy. Um, uh, that's not a success. I will avoid making things like that. Whereas, to, okay, I hope that makes sense. I want to make, I want to draw two conclusions from the, this example of cooking. First, which it is a predictive algorithm, right? And it requires only two ingredients, historical data and a definition of success. So remember that because we're going to use that again. But the main thing I wanted to mention is two things, which is number one, my son would not have had the, defini the same definition of success as I, I have. He would not have defined success as a meal where he eats vegetables. And the other thing I want to mention is like the person who's in charge of the algorithm gets to decide what success looks like. And I'm in charge of the cooking algorithm because I'm mom and he's a kid. And that's appropriate because I am his mom and he is my kid. But the general, the general sort of setup of algorithms is something like Facebook is telling us to trust its algorithm um, and it gets to decide what success is, which by the way, is keeping us on Facebook. Um, and it tries to also convince us that we don't have to ask the question, is this the same as the definition of success that I would have chosen? But it isn't, that's my point. The people in power get to decide what success looks like for them, not for you. And you don't get to decide because you're not in power. And that in general is a setup that we have to be highly aware of. Okay, so now I've told you what an algorithm is. I've told you about the power asymmetry. Now I'm gonna just give you a bunch of examples which I call WMDs, by which I mean they are widespread important systems, usually scoring systems, usually like predictions are really just scores. Like you, you can even standardize them and say, it's a score between zero and 100. And if you get above this cutoff, then you are um, eligible for something. And if you don't get above that, you, do, you are denied that opportunity. If it's a good thing, that's the way you would say it. So if you get a FICO score that's high enough, you get a good mortgage loan. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. It's a cutoff scoring system, which is important and, and used on a lot of people. It's also secret, it's mysterious. You don't know how your score was calculated. Actually, FICO is one of the less secretive scores. I write about in my book, the sort of my understanding of the history of FICO. It's actually, it was meant to um, stop 
things like racism and sexism, believe it or not. And we are given, we are allowed to see the data that goes into it. That's called our credit report. Well, most of the scoring systems, as we'll see, are nothing like that. They're not transparent at all. You have no idea what the data is. You don't know how it's scored. You do not know what your score is. You sometimes don't know you're being scored. When you go to a website, you go to a website and it just magically appears and you have no idea that, you know, this, if you saw the Capital One website like that, you only saw the crappy credit card ads because it already scored you as somebody who would be willing to take a crappy credit card. Um, and okay, so the last thing is it's destructive, it's unfair. It's like, it's denying you opportunities that you deserve. And by the way, like as soon as it's important and it's secret, you can probably guess that sometimes it's unfair. Um, and in particular, because it's secret, the mistakes are not caught. The mistakes are not fixed. Nothing is perfect, by the way, obviously, but I'm just making the point that like when something is secret and important, the fact that that mistakes aren't even caught is a problem. Um, and I will mention um, before I go on to examples that it's destructive, not just for the individual, but in my experience of doing this research, it creates a feedback loop that's destructive. And there's one, there's a bad feedback loop for every single one of these examples. I won't be able to go into all of them because I only have a short amount of time to speak. But if you have uh, questions about the feedback loops I'm talking about, then uh, then please ask. So the first example is from, from teaching. We had this terrible crap score that was supposed to decide whether a teacher was a good teacher based only on, on scores of standardized tests of the students. It was terrible. I mean, and it, this is a woman named Sarah Wasaki. She was actually fired based on her score, which she had a very good reason to believe was uh, artificially low because of other teachers cheating or maybe principals cheating on in previous years. But even, even when it wasn't artificially deflated, like for her, this score is, these scores were just not good statistically. And so one of the things I'm trying to show you in these examples, by the way, is like that all sorts of different kinds of problems can happen and that will lead to a weapon of mass destruction, a WMD. In her case, uh, this is called the value added model, um, it was really hard to get information on exactly how it worked or didn't work. I was very skeptical of it, but I couldn't get the actual information because it was being hidden. But this really smart uh, high school math teacher, um, uh, Gary Rubenstein, he found this data on different, uh, like on these teachers who had gotten scored for the same subject in the same year. So like, this sounds crazy because you're like, wait, seventh grade math, I taught seventh grade math and I taught eighth grade math. And like, I got scored twice because I, those are two different classes. And um, they're both those, both those numbers are supposed to tell me whether I'm a good teacher or not, whether I deserve to get fired, basically. Um, and so he just plotted them. This is the plot. And what you see here is that, so each dot there represents a teacher. You see that there are almost as many teachers that have like a very high and a very low score as there are teachers that have similar scores that have like a mid middle score and a middle score and a low score and a low score. In other words, this, this scatter plot is almost random. And what that means is that the underlying scoring system, the value added model for teachers is almost a random number generator. So let me just repeat that. Like the teachers were being fired based on what was essentially a random number generator. That's how bad it was. And it was being used in more than half the states. And this, this map is actually didn't even include Texas, which which was using it. Um, the reason I know that is because a, a, a lawsuit in Houston, um, a bunch of teachers um, sued because they got fired based on their value added model score and they won. Um, so yeah, it was a terrible score. Okay, so that's one example of a WMD. And I could you know, tell you exactly why it's a WMD. It's a scoring system that's unfair and it's important and widespread and, and unfair. And uh, it had this feedback loop of just getting rid of teachers um, because who wants to work in an environment like that? Here's another example. This is Kyle Beam. Kyle got denied a job that he was perfectly qualified for based on a personality test um, that just removed people that had mental health status that he had. And like to be more precise, he had bipolar disorder. He got treated for it in a hospital and he took like while he was at the hospital, took this mental health assessment. And then when he left the hospital after he was released, um, he like tried to get a job at a grocery store and he noticed that the questions of the personality test embedded those questions from the mental health assessment. So he recognized 
some of the questions. He's like, wait, there's like a, literally a mental health assessment inside this personality test. And also I failed the personality test and I didn't get the job. And so um, that's an example of a WMD. And I would, I could go on about it. Like his dad looked into it, his dad's a lawyer. And he found that this same test was being used on all sorts of, all sorts of uh, jobs in the uh, same area of Atlanta, Georgia. So it wasn't just screwing Kyle, it was screwing all people in Atlanta, um, applying to any of these big box stores um, you know, it was, in, and it was illegal, by the way, this is a, a, this is a, a law called the Americans with Disability Act that prevents um, job interviews from including a health exam, including a mental health exam. So there's that. Um, I wanted to give you a, uh, an example that's not from my book, because it, it came up more recently, Amazon.com. It was a uh, it was uh, trying to use its own data on hiring engineers to hire engineers automatically. But what it did was it like trained its data. So by the way, remember what it takes to build an, uh, a predictive algorithm, historical data, which it was Amazon's own data, and then definition of success. And I can just assume that Amazon's definition of success, like what makes a good engineer at Amazon is like, did this person get raises? Did this person get promoted? Did this person stay for a long time? Well, it built an algorithm based on something like that as a definition of success. Um, and then it noticed it was sexist. It noticed, for example, that if it used if the resume included a woman's college name like Barnard College, then it gave negative points. Um, it, it, it noticed all sorts of ways that it, you know, not, not very subtle, some, some more subtle than others, ways that it promoted men on average and demoted women in ter terms of their overall score to the point where it was a, a sexist algorithm, a sexist scoring system. Um, so that, that I thought was interesting. I mean, and by the way, just to be clear, you know, we know that promotions and who gets a raise and how long someone stays is not necessarily a reflection on the employee. It's a reflection on the system of raises, a system of uh, promotions and the underlying culture of a company. All of those things could be the problem of Amazon. And, and typically when they, when they have been investigated, implicit bias usually uh, rears its ever, uh, ugly head. And when I say usually, I mean like literally every study I've ever seen on corporate culture of raises and hiring and promotions say that it's sexist. So um, this should not be surprising to anyone. It also should not reflect um, it should not be interpreted as like women are worse engineers. It should be interpreted as Amazon treats women engineers more poorly than they treat men, men, uh, male engineers. And when they try to train their own data, they've discovered this, which they probably already knew. And I just want to say the previous example with the teachers, the first example of the teachers, that's like a problem of bad statistics. The second example with Kyle Beam, that's a problem of like intentional bias. It's actually, I, I met somebody who worked on that algorithm. They intentionally embedded that mental health assessment in there. That was intentional. This one, Amazon's example, that's biased data where it wasn't like intentional, like that probably the people didn't like say, oh, let's make this a sexist hiring algorithm. It just was a biased data set. The next example I have is what's I, was an even harder problem, which is I called missing data problem. Um, and this is an algorithm that is called predictive policing that decides where to send police um, based on where, where um, crimes, where, where arrests occur. And I'm being really careful with my words because th this is the missingness. The missingness is that we don't have crime data. We actually just don't have crime data. Most crimes do not end up in a data set. What we have is arrest data and arrests are not the same thing as crimes. Like there's a relationship, hopefully, um, hopefully like most arrests started at a crime, but it's not really true the other direction. Like most crimes do not lead to an arrest, even with like murder where you have a murder victim. Um, it's like half the time, a little bit less for black victims, a little bit more for white victims. So it's like, Never mind rape, where like it's underreported, and even the reported rapes are only like leading to an arrest seven percent of the time. It's like ridiculous how different those different things are: the set of crimes, the set of arrests. But what we're doing is we're pretending that arrests are a good proxy for the crime, and then we're sending cops back to the place where they've arrested people. Well, guess what? That just means you're sending cops back to the, like overpoliced black neighborhoods. Um, and you know, here's more evidence of that. Like. 
when you ask people if they smoke pot, black people and white people smoke pot at similar rates. But if you ask who gets arrested for smoking pot, black people get arrested for smoking pot at four times the rate of white people. And that's true over time. And, uh, and in fact, it, it depends a little bit on the precinct. Sometimes it's way more than four times. Sometimes it's 10 times more, depending on the police practices. So what I like to say is instead of thinking of it as predictive policing, call it predicting the police, because that's what you're really doing. You're just predicting where the police are going to arrest people. Downstream from that, we have these crime risk scores, which you might have heard of, um, which decide whether someone should, um, how long someone should go into prison based on whether they will get arrested when they leave prison within two years. Um, well, think to yourself, what would, what would be a way of figuring out somebody will get arrested after leaving prison? Well, look at these questions. Do you have a history of crime? Guess what? We've just discussed that this is not, this, this is data and data is not crime. So really when we say criminal history, we should call it arrest or conviction history, which is not the same thing as crime history. Um, there's a missingness problem and the missing crime data is much worse for white people than for black people. Then we asked, oh, did you get, you know, did you go to school? Did you finish school? Were you suspended? Um, are you poor? That's the financial thing. Are you, are you on welfare? Um, uh, get, the, get this family marital. Number 26, did your father go to prison? Literally unconstitutional question, but is in the context of this, this questionnaire is used. Um, then like, you know, did you grow up in a high crime neighborhood? Do you have gang friends? Do you have an addiction problem? Do you have a mental health problem? And the most Orwellian of all, um, do you have a bad attitude? Literally, if you say you have a bad attitude, you're then if you think the system is rigged against you, it is. Um, so this is the kind of questions that are asked on this scoring system. And in it, by the way, if you have a higher risk score, you get sentenced to longer in prison. So this is like, I told you there's a feedback loop for every example. Here's the, here it is spelled out for this one. If you're deemed high risk because of, basically you look like someone who will be profiled by the police, you get a longer sentence, you go to prison longer, um, guess what? People who go to prison longer don't actually uh, have a better life afterwards. They have a worse life because they have fewer resources, fewer connections to their community, fewer job prospects because of their felony. Um, and then they get back into the life of crime. So this is actually creating its own reality is my argument if it's being used. Um, the good news, by the way, since my book came out is like we found that the crime risk scores are almost entirely ignored by the judges. Although to be clear, only really ignored in the context of white defendants. For black defendants, there's some, well, it, it, it is, it, it's actually worse than being ignored in some sense. Okay, so another example. Well, this is actually another example, but also at the same time, a point I wanna make. This is um, coming from an appendix of a paper I could describe at length, but the, the main thing is it's about loans, like credit cards. And it's basically saying, well, if, if we're forced to not be racist, um, it's going to cost us money. How much money is it going to cost? Depends on what the definition of racist is. And so the, the, there's two points I want to make with this, this graph, which you don't even have to look at it. Just listen to my words. The first one is we haven't decided what it means to be racist in, in the context of algorithms. We, we don't have a definition of racism in the co context of algorithms. That's what I'm working on now, by the way, if you're gonna be asking me like, what are you working on now? I'm trying to, to force regulators to say what they mean uh, when they say this is a racist algorithm. Um, the second point is whenever a company decides to like strain their algorithm to a fairness definition, like a fairness of racism to, to, the, to whenever they say like, oh, we, we don't wanna be racist, so we're gonna constrain our algorithm, they're going to lose money. And depending on the definition, they're going to lose more or less money. So that means that unless all of the companies are forced to do it at the same time, they're just not going to do it. Um, Jonathan is, a, is an economist, so he can back me up here. Um, there is no particular company who wants to step forward and say, I'm willing to lose profit for um, some cause, even though none of my competitors are doing it. Um, and that's one of the problems. That's why regulators really have to define racism within the context of algorithms in a specific context of loans and credit cards or something like that before you can expect companies to actually follow any rules. And the, the current situation is all these industries are using algorithms and they are not following any rules except that they're optimizing profit. I didn't even have time 
this is a, supposed to be an example of like people being forced into their little filter bubbles on social media. I didn't have really time to talk about social media, but I'm sure we will in the Q&A, but I just want to make a point that algorithms are very, very good because they collect all this information on our behaviors and our, uh, uh, our characteristics, very good at sort of putting people into little boxes, little tribes and keeping them there, um, especially by, um, you know, the, by the terms of things like misinformation and QAnon and different kinds of crazy groups like that. And that is, I would say, not a completely new thing, but it is been turbocharged and made very, very easy and at scale in the context of algorithms and social media. Um, I also want to make the point that al algorithms aren't inherently evil. Like it's all about whether they're used for evil purposes. And the best example of that is like when you have a health score, like a health score, like, are you going to get diabetes? Just imagine you have like, everybody has a diabetes score. Everyone like is assigned a probability of getting diabetes in the next five years. That would be great if your doctor had that and was like keeping you healthy. But it would be evil if a health insurance company was like, oh, you're at a high risk of getting diabetes. We're just going to charge you so much that you can't afford health insurance, which is what I think is actually happening. So the point being, though, that like a given algorithm doesn't have to be evil or good. Even the crime risk score I mentioned before could be used for good. Um, and we could we could talk about that. Um, but nothing is inherently evil or good. It's a tool and it depends on the context, whether it's being used for evil or good. And that's really the point I want to make is that like this is ethics. These are tools. They're powerful. They're, they're more power than we've ever had because we've never had access to this much data and this much technology. And we're not using, we're not using our heads. We're not using our ethical, we're, we're not considering ethics. And that's what we need to change. And by the way, I don't mean that all data scientists should become ethicists because like that's too much. I think really what we should, we should think of the process of designing and deploying algorithms as a process that involves ethics. And the data scientists should be like charged with encoding the values chosen into code. Like in other words, they should be a translator from values into code rather than simply being asked to, to make those ethical choices, which is essentially what's happening now because data scientists are given way too much responsibility for these kinds of decisions. Um, I also want to call for like way more transparency into like these scoring systems that, that rule our lives. Like the teachers should have been able to see what their score was. What if I you know, had one fewer student or one more student? What if I taught at this other school? How would have my score have changed? Because then they would have realized how ridiculous that scoring system was and how unstatistical and non-robust it was. Um, I also think that just like a drug has to be approved by the FDA, an algorithm that is being used on a lot of people for important decisions should need approval. So we should have an FDA A, Food, Drug and Algorithm Administration. I think we should have to all these algorithms that are super important that are potential WMDs should go through an auditing process. And I want to, last thing I'll say is that there are so many lobbyists that are going to prevent all those things I just said from happening. But I also don't, I want to be realistic that this is a long, long fight um, to, to force people, people who are very interested in profit, to force them to consider uh, ethics. I, and by the way, when I say that, they're not going to consider ethics. What they need to do is be forced to comply with laws. And we do have the laws, we're just not enforcing those laws. So that's the end of my short presentation. I hope I didn't go on too long and I will stop sharing my screen so we can have a talk. Uh, hi, uh, thanks a lot, Kathy. Uh, very interesting. Okay, so our plan for the Q&A, we have some questions submitted in advance um, and we're going to start with those. I have those on my screen. Kathy's seen some of these. Uh, I, I don't think all of them. Um, and then um, People have already started putting questions into the Zoom Q&A, which we encourage also. And um, so go ahead, any, anything you think of, just put it in the Q&A whenever you think of it, and um, we'll get to as much of it as we can. Um, so I'm going to start um, the question submitted by Aidan Kelly, um, a junior majoring in math and computer science. Um, so he's curious, Kathy, how much and in what ways uh, you use social media? What way I use social media? Yeah. 
Well, I have to admit that like after um, Trump was elected, my book came out right before the election, by the way, before the before 2016. And I had like these utopian hopes of like working for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and like making sure that credit card companies and mortgage companies were like complying with anti-discrimination law. After the election, I was like, oh, that's not gonna happen. Um, and uh, I was right, like the, that Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has been completely obliterated. In fact, if anything, it's working for the insurance companies um, and, and the credit card companies and the subprime auto companies. Anyway, um, but I just remember being on Facebook after the election and like all these people on the left on my, in my Facebook friend circle, um, which arguably was way too large because I never said no to a Facebook friend request. Um, they were like literally saying it's not too late for Hillary to be the president. And I was like, what are you talking about? You are like actually crazy. And I get like why you want that to be true, but that's not the same thing as it being true. And so I just saw people go nuts and I was like, I can't be here for it. It's like being like at a cocktail party where like the drunkest, loudest people are the only ones that are ever in front of you and you can't find anything that's useful. So I quit Facebook then. I'm still on Twitter, which is itself a kind of toxic environment, but it's very useful for journalism. And I'm also a journalist. So it's like, I use it as a research tool, um, but I've tried very hard not to get swept up. And if, you, if we do have time for to discuss my, my newer book, the book that I'm writing now called The Shame Machine, I can talk, talk a little bit about, more about that. Okay. Thanks. Um, so next question I'm going to read you from uh, Mishka Narasimhan, um, a first year student in biology. Um, so uh, Mishka saw The Social Dilemma, the recent Netflix documentary, um, and you were in it, and you said there that Google can't configure algorithms to differentiate between conspiracy and truth uh, because you said they don't have a proxy for truth that's better than clicks. Um, so uh, Mishka's wondering, as long as there exists two sides to an issue, uh, does objective truth even exist on social media? Um, if Google can't define what is true, how can it begin to curb misinformation? Yeah. Her name is Sasha. Who Mishka. Asked? Mishka. Mishka is absolutely right on. And I wish, I wish um, um, Mishka was a senator because um, like Zuckerberg and, and those and all those guys um, keep on going to Congress and lying with straight faces about what AI can do. Um, and like the senators never push back on it or the Congress people there, they never say, but wait a second, uh, that doesn't even make sense. And let me just make the argument that it doesn't make sense. It has nothing to do with math. And I'm going to go back to the teacher evaluation that I would talked about. Like if you, if you guys have ever met, educators, you'll know what I'm saying when I say that if you took 10 education experts, like 10 pedagogy experts and got them in the same room and said, what does it mean for a teacher to be a good teacher? You would not find agreement. You would not find 10 people that could agree on what it means for a teacher to be a good teacher. So for you to just say, well, we don't really know what a good teacher is, but we're going to hand over that decision to an algorithm and then fire teachers with bad scores, even though nobody understands what the scores actually mean, you'd realize that that literally couldn't work because even if it agreed with one of those 10 people, it couldn't agree with all 10 of them. In other words, if we can't answer a question as humans, then an, a computer can't answer it. The best we could possibly imagine is if we can agree quite readily on an answer as humans, then the computer might be able to replicate us. That's much, much more likely. So the example I like to give where this is very, very clear cut is with chess or go or checkers. Like who won that game? What is the goal of playing chess? You know what the goal is because everybody is agreed when somebody's won chess. So, and it, okay, so you probably agree with me at this point, but I, what I want to connect the dots on is you have probably noticed that AI folks are super, super proud of their chess algorithms and their Go algorithms and their checkers algorithms. They constantly throw this up as some kind of example of how amazing AI is. 
And what I would say is it's really good at things that are clear cut like that, that are tiny little toy universes where there's no discussion about what it means to succeed. Remember, like we've talked about this a bunch of times. That was the whole point of my example of my, my son and his Nutella and my example, of, like I like vegetables. I like him eating vegetables. He likes eating Nutella. The whole point is we do not agree on the definition of success. So if you have a situation where you're trying to arbitrate a messy, culturally complicated situation where there are different stakeholders and they have different definitions of success, an algorithm cannot do that except by just making a choice for the person who's building the algorithm, which is to say all the other stakeholders get left out in the cold. So, the, so that's a very important point, not exactly the point that Mishka was asking, but it's related. So I will just ask the same question about a given piece of misinformation. Some things are clearly not true and some things are clearly pretty factually based and true. And then there's a whole ton of things in the middle where you're like, well, it's, you know, it's probably true that someone named Jesus once lived like bubble, you know, like who knows, like, it's just really up for interpretation and maybe it's 75% true and 25% false, but depending on who you are, you care about the true or the false part. The point is that like, we can't decide on what's true as a society, 10 people cannot come together, just like the teachers I was talking about, 10 people can't decide whether something's true or false. How can an algorithm do it? It simply can't. An algorithm can, only, the best you could hope for is the algorithm could, could replicate one of those people's opinions, but not all of them because they can't agree with each other. So that's the, the like sort of thought experiment on why this cannot work. Now, in terms of how close is it to getting anywhere near replicating any one person, it's not near it. It's very stupid, actually. Very, very stupid how these things actually work. Like what they basically do is look for keywords. So if, if you're Facebook and you're trying to build a, like a, 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 a catcher for misinformation, you're going to look for things like QAnon, the word QAnon, right? And obviously what happens is it uh, basically it's an arms race. At that point, the QAnon folks who want to have their conversations and they want to attract new members aren't going to use that name, that word anymore because they know they're going to get caught. They're going to get filtered out. So they're just going to figure out a way to use a different set of words that will still attract the people they're trying to attract. So that's, I would call that an arms race of algorithms, but there's, there's by no means do I think that what Facebook is actually doing or any of the large tech companies to try to find like filter out misinformation is anything more than a fancy keyword search. How is Facebook doing it a more limited goal of identifying whether someone talking to you on Facebook is actually from your hometown or is from Russia, let's say? Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, there, there's probably, there's, there's definitely ways of, for fancy sophisticated hackers to make it seem like they're from any particular place. Right. Um, again, that's another arms race. Like Facebook is probably pretty good at figuring out, oh wait, you're using Tor, so I don't trust what it looks like you're from. Um, so there's like that arms race too of like pr pretending you're from one place or another. But there's no, like the thing, the thing, the real thing is, Jonathan, is that Facebook has no incentive to win that arms race because they're literally, worst case scenario for them is that they get fined a 10th of their earnings that quarter. Like they, even when they get in trouble, they don't really have to pay and they don't lose that many um, users. Um, they still make just a boatload of money um, by ignoring the problem. So there's no incentive. Like I, by the way, I am not somebody who's pessimistic on like how amazing algorithms can be someday. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed by the Go algorithm, right? Um, we could probably do a much, much better job at some of this stuff, but not in the current climate where there's literally no incentive. And when the heads of these big tech giants go try to explain themselves to Senate, the Senate and the Congress, like they're basically given a free ride. So I'll, I'll say one last thing about that. Ultimately, all the politicians are beholden to these platforms because political ad campaigns are largely on these platforms. 
and they all think that they can't do without that technology. So they really don't want to close down Facebook because they think they win elections on Facebook. Um, so that's another huge problem for incentives for getting getting rid of um, the actual problems. Very interesting. Um, thanks a lot. Um, okay, uh, so we have a question from Jack uh, Passan, who's a first year majoring in computer science. Um, so he says, your book criticized predictive advertising algorithms that target ads to low income individuals um, for expensive for profit college or high interest loans, uh, services uh, that can harm those individuals. And the question is, if such an individual enrolls in college or borrows, uh, they're voluntarily choosing those transactions that they believe beneficial. Um, so if such a transaction later turns out negatively for the customer, um, why does the algorithm's unfair targeting um, reduce the customer's individual accountability uh, for their decision? Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a wide variety of uh, individual responsibilities um, that are, you could, you could assume. Um, I would argue that the most predatory algorithms, the most predatory industries um, win in every ad auction. So let me try to explain that. So what happens is um, everybody's attention is valued by the ecosystem on the advertise, in, uh, internet advertising. My attention is pretty highly valued because I have lots of money, I tend to buy impulsively, especially with um, yarn. I really like silk and cashmere yarn. And when I go through certain phases, like I am very vulnerable um, to tailored advertisement for especially gem toned cashmere yarn. I would love some of that right now. Um, the point is that like, I'm worth a lot of money to yarn companies if they can get their advertisement in front of my eyes. And I'm not alone. Everybody has their thing that they're, they're sensitive to, their soft spot. But some people have more money than others. So like people like me who are <clears throat> willingly spending a lot of money on luxury items, we're, we're wonderful for the, for the advertisers. Then there's other people that don't have money. Um, so how does, how does an advertiser try to get, like who, who gets their attention? Who pays for their attention? And the answer is they pay for their for that, th them to go into debt um, and they have to sell a story to those people to make it seem like a good idea to go into debt. Um, but the way that an ad auction actually works is like there's every, there's a lot of different ads that are being considered for me. Um, but the, the people that have more information about me and have a better fit with my soft spot are going to be offering more money for my attention. And the people that, and then there's an ad auction for me when there's an actual example of a moment when an ad could be shown to me. And the people offering the most amount of money at that moment are the ones who win the, uh, the, the opportunity to show me an ad that I may or may not click on. When I click on it, by the way, that's when the person is actually paid uh, the, the, the money. And it could be like 15 cents, one cent, if it's, a, if it's not a very good auction, not a very like strong auction for the, for the, Private, the, sorry, the for-profit colleges, it was like $3. It was, a, which doesn't sound like that much money, but just for one click, that's a lot of money. Um, why? Well, because they had the best come on for these people that they had highly, highly selected. Now, when I say selected, they didn't just say these people um, haven't gone to college and they need to go to college. No, single black mothers who, um, whose parents haven't gone to college, but who want better lives for their children. And the, the come on was, don't you want a better life for your child? Um, isn't it the, like, the, don't you want to live the American dream? It was like a shaming um, sell, uh, which was predatory. And I'm not just saying that, it was considered predatory by, um, by the regulator who actually like, for example, Kamala Harris, as the Attorney General of California, 
went after quite a few of these um, these Cal, uh, these in Catholic Corinthian college for profit colleges because not only did they come on to people with this, those kinds of hard sells, but they also just lied about what the offering was. They said you're going to get educated, you're going to get all these good jobs. They didn't get most of them never graduated, which they weren't told was a risk. They, the education quality was very low and then they weren't actually more qualified for a job than they had been with a high school diploma. So it was just, it was false advertising. It was fraudulent and it was predatory. Um, now it, it sounds to me like there's somebody who's asking the question like, why is that, why is it illegal to be predatory? Um, that's, that's, that's a really interesting question, but it's not my choice, right? I'm, what I'm trying to describe is like, we have these laws. Laws are sort of like the way I look at it, and you could disagree with me. I'm not a lawyer, but they're like a very lagged indicator of of public ethical opinion. Um, so if we see, see something really unethical happening over and over again, at some point we come up with a law against it. Um, and so that's kind of the way I see it. It's not. It wasn't me saying I'm Kathy and I think this should be illegal. It's more like. We, we've made a technology that allows fraudulent and predatory practices to um, be sort of sharpened and uh, like honed with precision at scale on Facebook. And whereas the VCs, the venture capitalists who think this is a great thing because people like me get my yarn, the flip side of that is it's also a place where people who are vulnerable to high interest loans and for-profit college come-ons get preyed upon. And I guess the, the part of the distinction you're making where something becomes predatory is if they're intentionally disguising the nature of the product, right? I mean, they're withholding information such as graduation rates, um, distorting the terms of the loan perhaps. And what kind of job you could get after this college. Yeah. By the way, I worked with a I worked with the Attorney General Office of Illinois on predatory payday loans, um, and in the exact in the case I was working on, there's a usury rate of 36% in Illinois. So, going back to the question of like why is this illegal? Like, well, you ask ask yourself why do you think as a society we decided certain loans we should not have interest rates higher than a certain number. And it's because people kept on getting into these debt spirals where they had to take out more loans to pay back the old loans and they never got out of uh, loan um, hell. But so in this, in the case I was working on, it wasn't that on the, on the surface, they were charging more than the usury rate of 36%. What they were doing instead was they were charging a non-optional insurance fee at a monthly rate that made the effective interest rate more than 500%. So it was exactly as you said, Jonathan, it was like hidden. Um, it, it was like a hidden and like fraudulent description of what was actually happening. I think that's an important, uh, an important aspect. There. But I just, I'll make the point that like to be predatory and I'm not a lawyer, but like to be predatory, my understanding is it's either hidden like that or it's just above the usury rate, which is not hidden, but it is also considered predatory. Thanks. Um, so, um, a question from Jared Phillips, um, a first year undergraduate, um, brings up an example you gave in your book, you, uh, statistical models in sports, you gave um, as an example of um, an algorithm that works well. Yeah. Um, examples, and he asks, um, are those the best examples of unbiased algorithms? And I guess he's, he's wondering if you have other positive examples. Well, to be clear, I'm not saying they're unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that as far as algorithms go, they're pretty great because what, well, one of the reasons I think they're great is let's say they are biased, which they probably are. I mean, I don't even know what it means to not be biased. I always think of the bias as just like something, we call it bias if we're uncomfortable with it. Like if we're comfortable with it, we're like, that's fine. Um, but you know, like the whole point of the early Moneyball story, which I'm not an expert on, um, but as I understand it is like, people were just valuing the wrong thing. And someone who's like, well, I've got a new definition of success for my team. I'm gonna optimize to this new metric. And I think I'm gonna win, you know, the World Series. And they were right. So like the point is that it's like, it's kind of more like an open market, a free competitive market. Like there's like, 
people can say, here's how I, here's my metric. They don't have to be transparent about it. I, I understand that like more recently, every team has their own secret metric of what exactly they value in a player. But it's the point is that you, you know, it's open enough, it's transparent enough um, for people to just to say, hey, I think what you're doing is wrong and here's why. Um, and what it does is it creates a feedback loop that is not destructive. It is constructive in the sense that like, if you made a mistake, you're gonna find it. You're gonna find out you made a mistake, either because like somebody else does a better job, which is one way of finding out you've been doing it wrong, or by like you, um, you lose a player because you're like, I don't value that player with, my metric does not see that player as very valuable. And then the, the player goes on to kill it in another, on another team. You're gonna see that mistake happen. Whereas I wanna compare that to a, something like a hiring algorithm like that Kyle Beam was filtered out by. You know, the, 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 the users of that algorithm, which in this case was Kroger's grocery store, they're never gonna find out that he would have been a good employee. He's just gone. He was filtered out and never to be seen again. So that's the kind of mistake that doesn't get, get improved upon. Whereas with the sports, it does get improved upon. The final thing I'd say is like probably individual sports players hate Moneyball because they were considered hot um, before the metric was changed into where they aren't hot. And that's fair. I mean, I'm not saying, when, when I say it's a good algorithm, I'm not saying that everyone loves it. I'm saying that um, as algorithms go, it actually gets into this constructive feedback loop where things are improved rather than just harm, like harm just going crazy and getting worse and worse over time. Yeah, I think one thing that distinguishes sports is that the final objective of winning is something that everyone agrees on. Thank you, Jonathan. That's, and yeah. I'll add one more thing. So yes, that's another thing, like the definition of success is winning. Now, you could argue that winning a given game isn't the point, it's winning the World Series. Like you could you could argue about that, but at the very least, you know, like if you're not trying to win the World Series either this year or next year, like you're not doing it right. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing though, that's also really important is the data itself is like, you couldn't have more clean, you couldn't have cleaner data. Like we talked about biased data being a problem or missing data being a problem. Well, in this case, it's like televised games where literally, I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. I sit around listening to uh, sports radio where they spend like hours arguing about whether a given play should have been considered an error or a hit. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, that's how much we go, like pick over the bones of our data to make sure that it's clean. Um, compare that to the way like you see women systematically not getting raises or not getting promotions and it just never gets even picked up. It's not, nobody measures that because guess what? They don't wanna know that. Um, usually corporations are not eager to figure out exactly how sexist their hiring practices or their promotion practices are. So it's just a completely different level of transparency. Yeah, um, it's, and this is why so many people get their start into loving statistics by looking at sports data data so good, right? It's like the I old can understand why they love it, but they also get this impression that everything is really good when it's really right, good. right, right. I mean, it's a little like the old story where you're looking for your keys under under the lamp, not because they're anywhere near there, but because the, the light is good, right? It's fun to study sports because you can get exactly. Um, okay, um, so uh, Katie So of a first year undergraduate asks. Um, how big data influenced your decision to uh, to leave your previous career? I don't know which one they're talking about. But <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say like I I'm like a professional quitter to be honest. Um, I was working as a mathematician, and I guess I don't really know. I I think I probably left. By the way, I'll, this is an opportunity for me to plug a book by Eugenia Cheng, who's a female mathematician who just wrote a book called X plus Y, A Manifesto and Gender. And I think she kind of explained to me through that book, which I reviewed for the New York Times last month, that why I left math. It was just like a very, con it's what she calls congressive uh, culture or ingress of culture. Now I got the names wrong. Okay. Well, she, it basically super competitive and kind of nasty. And I was like, 
I'd rather, you know, work with people. Um, why does it have to, why do we always have to feel like it's a zero sum? Like if I do well, you're not doing well. Um, so I did the stupidest possible thing, considering that's what I didn't like about um, the math department at Columbia. I went into a hedge fund where it was like so much worse than that. Um, and also uh, it was like, I didn't take, but the, the good thing was that it was so bad and so nasty as a, and competitive as an atmosphere that I didn't take it personally. Like I didn't think it should be nice. Like in the math community, I was like, why aren't people nice? You know, I'm, my feelings are hurt. And when I was at the hedge fund, I was like, wow, everyone here is such an asshole that it's not even personal. Um, but what was interesting about that is like, it was the credit crisis. Like right when I walked in the door, that's when it all went down. And I was frankly disgusted by, you know, the part that hedge funds played and in that whole story. So I left to become a data scientist a couple of years after that. And then I was like, oh, as a data scientist, I'm doing essentially the same thing. I'm creating like monstrous, terrible things to take advantage of um, the system um, without regard for my own internal sense of what right and wrong. And so I, I quit that too. Um, and then I wrote the book. And now I'm actually a, kind of a data scientist again, but I'm working for myself. I started a company to audit algorithms and that's you know in that context i'm working with like the attorney generals and stuff to try to figure out like what do you mean when you say um this hiring algorithm can't be racist because there's a law against racist hiring algorithms like what does that mean exactly exactly what does that mean because we want to tell the hiring algorithm companies here is the rule you have to follow because if we don't have a rule for them they're just gonna not gonna follow any rules so that's what i do now i don't know if i answered the question but i told you a story <laughs> I think, yeah, there are uh, a lot of possible answers there. <laughs> I think you got at it. Um, so uh, the next question um, is from uh, Spencer Friedhoff, a junior majoring in computer science. Um, so he's intending to go into a career in big data analysis when he graduates. Um, and what advice do you give on how to do that in an ethical manner? How to do that with what? Um, how to go into big data analysis in an ethical manner. Okay. It's going to be hard, to be honest. I mean, really hard. <laughs> I, I have like a framework that I use called the ethical matrix framework. And I wrote about it with a philosopher I met, a very cool woman named Hannah Gunn. And it just got published in this book called like AI ethics or something like that um, with a bunch of other essays um, or the other chapters. Um, it's edited by my, Matthew Lau from NYU law. So, or maybe philosophy. Um, I can maybe send you the link, but the, the, the larger point is that like, there's a whole lot of money in computer science jobs if you don't give a shit about ethics. I'm sorry, I'm just like a potty mouth because it's Friday at five o'clock for me. And wow, what a week. Um, but I'll try not to I'll try not to be a potty mouth. There's a lot of opportunities for people that are willing to look the other way, depending on their what their employer is doing. And there's like it's much harder to have like to have a job where you're like, I don't want to do this and you can't make me. Like one of the things that I'm hoping to see for data science in the near future is like a, a sort of professional society along the lines of like the way doctors or lawyers have um, like bar associations. I'm not saying that they're all good because I'm sure as an economist, you know, you realize that like having a gatekeeper for an industry sometimes just makes it harder um, for certain people and not harder for other people. But what I like about it is like, if you have an ethical promise as a member of your professional society, then it's supposed to be a code that you all work with. So let, let me just, let me give you a, an example. Like if you, if you, if I worked at Facebook um, and I was told, okay, now I want you to build an algorithm that um, predicts whether someone's going to feel suicidal. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how we're going to use this. <laughs> I'd be like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to build that algorithm because you could use it to like convince people to kill themselves for all I know. Like I need to know more information, right? I'm not willing to do this. Um, I would just get fired. 
currently like the current situation is i would get fired and i would have no no, no argument against it because that's the way it works but if I was part of a professional society, I could say, actually, look, you're, you're trying to ask me to do something against my code of ethics. And my professional society is going to make a huge stink about this if I report you, especially if I get together with like a group of other data scientists and we all agree that what you've been doing here is unethical. Like it, it will be the sort of job of the professional society to make a big fuss out of it. Kind of like an ACLU type thing for civil liberties, but like this would be for data ethics. I'm, I think that will happen at some point. Um, it hasn't happened yet. So this is a tough time to be an ethical data scientist. I, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of sympathy for someone like that. And <clears throat> all I would say is please be a mole. You know, just be like, if you can't be an ethical data scientist at the very least be a mole, like be in the sense that like, be a socio sociologist or an anthropologist, like write down, here's what happened today. Here's like the ethical quandary I was put in and I was told to do such and such, but I felt really uncomfortable about it. And I talked to this person and this is the advice. They just write yourself emails explaining what you had to deal with that day. And like, if things get really bad, you'll have documentation for like what you've been going through. Um, and then you can definitely send it to like the New York Times if you're working at Facebook or something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it does seem that some companies are at least are trying or at least um, trying to appear to create a culture where employees can have sounding boards. I mean, you hear about um, lots of employee sort of organized uh, discussion at Facebook and Google. Um, does that, this kind of thing I read stories about, does that seem to you like it's, like it's helping. It seems like there are at least discussions there among the employees about the, the ethics of the company, including walkouts, things like that. Yeah, and you know, it depends on the company. Um, I think I think the Google employees have more of sway and more of a a CEO that will listen. Although I'm not saying it would be easy to make a stand at Google than a place like Facebook or Amazon, where it's like, it's famous for, both of those places are famous for being like, okay, you're fired then. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I do think organizing is a really smart thing to do. And I think tech workers should organize within their companies. But I, as I say, I would, I'm holding out for tech workers organizing at this level, at the ethical like level as a professional society um, across companies. Cause I think that will have the most power ultimately. Yeah, and as you mentioned before, no one wants to be the one company to go ethical, so. Good, um, so I'm gonna, I'm clicking over now to the, uh, to the live Q&A. Um, so uh, Ken Lindley asked if you can give an example of how you would encode ethics into an algorithm. Right, that's a great question. It's not easy and it's not, it's not uh, automatic, like there's no algorithm for ethics. <laughs> um, I have what I said I described as the ethical matrix framework and I'm just gonna really quickly tell you what that looks like. I take an algorithm and a context. So remember the example with the diabetes um, risk score, like you can't just take an algorithm and decide what the ethics are of the algorithm because it really depends on how it's used. Again, if a diabetes risk score is used by your doctor to keep you healthy, that's good. If it's used by an insurance company to price you out of insurance, that's evil. So you, you have to have the context in mind before you can talk about the ethics of an algorithm. And so I, with the context in mind, what I ask for is to build a matrix and there's rows and there's columns in a matrix. The rows are the stakeholders and the columns are their concerns. And the idea of this is to ask the question, broadly speaking, what does it mean for this algorithm to, to succeed or fail? And for whom does it fail? So as soon as you ask that question, for whom does it fail? I mean, that's, I think the critical question. Um, you're, you're acknowledging the fact that different people experience the algorithm and its context differently. Um, so just to, just to try to, complete to convince you a little bit of how powerful this question is for whom does this fail just imagine facial recognition software being asked this question or the people who are building facial recognition software at ibm at amazon at uh there was a third company 
Um, so my friend Joy Bolomwini, who works, who was a student at the MIT Media Lab, um, actually I met her at my first book, my book talk at the Harvard Bookstore. Um, that was the night she decided to start the uh, algorithmic, just, algorithmic Justice League. And by the way, she's the star of this documentary coming out pretty soon on Netflix called Coded Bias. She's amazing. I think she's going to win an Oscar. I swear to God, it's going to be amazing. Um, anyway, she audited facial recognition. Why? Because she realized that she was she's she's a black woman. She her her facial recognition software, which she was supposed to be using to build a master's thesis, didn't recognize that she had a face because her skin tone was dark. It like she didn't have a face according to this uh, algorithm. She had to put a mask on, which was a white mask, in order to be recognized as a face. And then it asked, it inspired her to ask more questions. And she ultimately audited all these sort of commercially available facial recognition software packages by these big companies. And she found that like they were, if you, if you asked them to identify the gender and the race of the person, they were much, much, much more accurate on white men than on women or people of color or especially black women. So, and it was embarrassing. IBM was super embarrassed and like immediately tried to improve their algorithm and, and did improve their algorithm. Um, Amazon still maintains that they don't have a problem because they're assholes. Sorry, I'm, I'm terrible with my potty mouth again. Um, and Microsoft also tried to fix them, but that like, gets very delayed. But okay, so many, but the point is like a huge, huge fiasco. Um, Joy became famous in the New York Times, like talking about this. I was, I was present when she was speaking to before a sub congressional subcommittee about facial recognition and how it is not trustworthy and shouldn't be used by the police for these various reasons. And I just want to ask you the question, like imagine if IBM, Amazon and Microsoft had all asked the question, for whom does this fail? Before putting out, out that algorithm to the public. Like what if they just asked that simple question, like, oh, this seems to work because it's accurate. But what if they had said, instead of thinking the overall accuracy, which was very high, because by the way, the training and the testing set was filled with white men's faces. Instead they had asked, well, for whom does this fail though? And what does it mean to fail? Then they would have come up with this exact audit and then they would have solved the problem before it happened. Um, at least that particular problem. By the way, just to be clear, there are other problems with facial recognition, especially in the hands of the police because the police are using the facial recognition software as if it's a, what is it called? Something about sus being suspected. It's an, enough inform enough like of a, sus if an algorithm fingers you, if they say if like, they're using it in the following way, that if a facial recognition algorithm says, this is you in this picture, of, in this video of someone stealing, mo stealing money from a gas station, that, oh, it's that, I keep, I keep forgetting the, this phrase, but it's like enough evidence to arrest you. Um, that's, by the way, in that context of police using facial recognition, that's a problem. Um, and it's a biggest problem is, guess who the police have in their picture database? Normally they have the very people that they have processed, like in the New York, New York City, for example, the New York City Police Department has in their database of pictures, the people they've arrested. And we talked earlier about who they've arrested. So in other words, they have a bunch of black people, uh, mostly men, but men and women, uh, poor people. And so when they're looking for a, 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 a fit between a, like a picture of a robbery and somebody in their database, they're much, much more likely to have a fit with a, a person of color. Long story short, I don't want to, I don't want to claim that the accuracy for black faces is the only problem with the algorithm. Um, and so to answer your question, I, I know I'm, I'm going on a kind of a long, a long roundabout way of saying this, but the truth is you can't know what it means to have an ethical algorithm until you have a very thorough understanding of the context, a very thorough understanding of who is impacted by this algorithm in this context and a very thorough understanding of what it means for them that something is unfair or that it is fair and it's working. Um, and it's typically really multi-dimensional. That's why it's a matrix. It's not like, 
I've already mentioned, okay, so I've mentioned like with facial recognition of like accuracy is a consideration by the people who deployed it. Um, false positives by the people, like by black people who are arrested by the police, like false negatives, um, transparency, explicability. There's all sorts of ways that people can say, well, I need to understand this. I need to know how often this fails. And the different stakeholders is also a long list of things. So my point is that there's like, it's, it's a two dimensional grid of considerations and the ethics lies in understanding how you balance the the concerns of the different stakeholders and their different concerns. And it's pretty complicated. And it often comes down to what ends up being a kind of a trolley problem. Like we're going to consider the people, these stakeholders desires against these stakeholders concerns over here on a different column. And we have to, we can't get both of them perfect. So we have to, just, we have to sort of um, sacrifice some accuracy in this direction for some transparency in that direction. It's something, it's going to look along, along those lines and it's going to be complicated and it's not easy. And it's going to be different for every context. Hey, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, that was a tough one. Uh, so Christopher Braswell asks, um, are there any industries, decision processes or situations where algorithms are not currently being used, uh, where they should. Um, does he have an idea, like, of what, <laughs> where, where that might be? Yeah. If you want to uh, type something to us, you can. I one. mean, look, if you, if I had my way. Um, There'd be a very, very simple algorithm for how do we deal with um, protecting ourselves with the coronavirus. <laughs> how do we include wearing a mask? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. Like, it, ultimately, it's a political decision um, whether to have an automated decision process. Um, and it's usually the people who are in charge that get to decide what, what process it is and how to use it. So, of course, I personally have political opinions, you know, and I would like to s stop this nonsense of, of negotiation and say everyone needs a mask. That's my algorithm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, but that ultimately nice. is a political choice. And so it's not, I, I, I can't think of an example where an algorithm is being used that is apolitical and obvious or isn't being used and it should be used in an apolitical sense. Thanks. Um, so John Allen asks, how should equity be regulated in algorithm approval audits, um, especially in the case where there are a large number of distinct groups, um, ethnic, cultural, and gender groups? How do we define what groups are included in these regulations and protections? Um, and what level of government is the most necessary uh, to take note of these issues? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I'm not a lawyer, nor am I an ethicist, actually. Um, but I will say that when I have clients for my auditing company, like we have a, um, a minimum required um, consideration when, in, in building the ethical matrix, which is like, are you legal? So if, you, if there is a law, usually it's an anti-discrimination law, and usually there are like the a list, there is a specific list of protected classes. So you're like, okay, are you, if you're hiring, for example, are you um, discriminating against old people? Are you discriminating against uh, people of color? Are you discriminating against people with mental health problems? Are you discriminating against people with disabilities? Are you discriminating against veterans? Like there's a list, you can just go through the list. Now, is it the list I would have built? No, I would have made it longer. In particular, the thing I can't really get, through, get over my head, but like, I think is a deep, profound question is why it is not illegal to discriminate against poor people. It is totally legal to say, oh, you're poor, I can treat you badly. Now it's, it's not usually, it doesn't usually end up being completely legal because there's a correlation between people of color and poor people. So usually the argument is you can't do it that way because you end up being racist. But 
I think it's actually crazy that it is technically legal to discriminate against poor people. So class is not a protected class. I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so Sarah, Sarah Zhu asks um, your opinion on situations where the best known algorithm is biased but less biased than the humans who would replace that? Is are there other situations like it, that? Does Sarah have an example? Well, you can type a, type a chat to us if there's an example you're thinking of. Uh, I think you, you often mentioned in, okay, thanks Sarah. Um, you often did mention in your book that, you know, the processes that came before the algorithm were yeah. really biased also. The, absolutely. Let's let's talk about the um, the crime risk scores of sentencing people using uh, the crime risk score, which again was is predicting um, whether someone will get arrested after leaving prison. Um, very biased, a, a bias against poor people, bias against people that don't have um, health insurance and can't get treated for addiction or mental health problems. Um, bias against people who are already profiled by the police. So people considered gang members. So basically people of color. So very biased against poor people of color. Well, guess what? Judges were biased against poor people of color too. That's famously known. I still don't know. And I wrote that book a while ago. Like if the algorithms are more biased than the judges or vice versa, because we still don't know. So I, one of the one of the most frustrating mm. things about this is that we just don't have enough actual science going on. Like we call it data science, but it's really not yet a science. It's not experimental. We don't really do that. There have been some experiments. I'm not saying there have been none. I've written about some of them for Bloomberg. So you can look it up if you'd like. Um, and most of them have have inferred that judges essentially ignore the score most of the time. <laughs> and in particular, they ignore the score whenever they feel at personal risk of getting in trouble if somebody uh, you know, gets out and commits another crime. So they ignore low scores, especially for poor people of color, and they accept low scores for richer peop white people. And so it actually has this kind of weird effect of if you ignore the score at, at, at opportunities like that, like then the judge's own racist bias and, and classist bias seems to outweigh the scoring system. So I'm not really arguing against that idea, by the way. But I, I, what I would like to argue is that if, you know, if I had my way, if I, had the F, if I was in charge of the FDAA, I mentioned earlier, Food, Drug and Algorithm Administration, then I would, one of the rules I would say is, and this is done in medicine, by the way, with drugs, like with drugs, you ask, show me that this works better than the current medicine or the current treatment, or at least as well as the current treatment. Show me it works at least as well as the current treatment. Why should I give you a patent on a new medicine if it's worse than the old medicine? Well, that's what I would like to do with algorithms. Like show me this algorithm is not more destructive than the current process. We don't have anything like that. And, it, and, and what happens is people are replacing human processes with algorithms, mostly for considerations around money rather than around fairness or even effectiveness. Thanks. Um, and we have a question from Jacob Kraft. And I think this was um, something that came up in your book. Um, do you think targeted algorithms have played a role in developing a politically polarized country? Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of the thing I was talking about with uh, Facebook filter bubbles. I definitely think, I, I mean, I definitely think that algorithms bring us down the rabbit hole. Like the YouTube algorithm has been shown to do that. The Facebook algorithm, for sure. Like recommendation of groups on Facebook has, there's plenty of evidence that that just radicalizes people or it brings them into conspiracy rabbit holes which i think are this is almost the same thing at this point because like the conspiracy theories are also so politicized and, and polarized so yeah for sure i think that's undebatable at this point thanks um well we have a little more time i think everyone might um really like to hear about your current book project which i've read a little bit about on your blog um and which 
I'm sure you have a lot to, to say about that. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm writing a book called The Shame Machine, and it's about um, a different kind of weaponization, but I think related to weapons of math destruction. It's weaponizing shame. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story that actually inspired me to think more deeply about shame, which is that going back to the teacher value added model, I interviewed a bunch of teachers and what baffled me is why they didn't demand an explanation. Um, like they're getting fired. They're getting fired based on a random number generator. Like they didn't know it was a random number generator, but it was. But I it just kept coming to me like, why would I let a random number generator fire me from a job that I really love? You know, I wouldn't stand for that. I kept saying that to myself and I wanted to understand how it had actually worked. And I, so I asked these people, the teachers and the principals, and they kept on coming back with the same thing, which was like, well, they told me it was math and I wouldn't understand it. I tried to ask. But they told me it was math and I couldn't understand it. And I asked six times and they always said that. And I was like, what is that? Like, and, and, and Jonathan, like you and I are math nerds. Um, that wouldn't have worked on us. If someone said to me, it's math, you wouldn't understand it. I'd be like, you are full of shit. If you can't explain it to me, then I don't trust it. I'm a mathematician. You can't pull that off over on me, right? I would have been like, what, right? But the point is that, I realized that that does work. It is a tactic and it was a highly, highly effective tactic. And what it was, was shaming. It was math shaming. It was basically like, you're not smart enough. You're not, you're not a PhD in math. Don't ask, you don't have the right, you're not smart enough. You're not in the smart club. So you don't, you don't get to know. And it annihilated people, annihilated people. I mean, I asked them how it felt and they were like, I was, confused. I had lost my sense of my rights. It took, it was very rare to find a teacher that was like, no. And then I pushed back saying, bullshit, tell me why. Like, nope, nobody said that. I think one person said that. And he was like a 30 year veteran of teaching who had won a bunch of teaching awards and was like, I'm not insecure about my teaching ability. So this something must be something wrong with what you're doing. Like he really was not insecure. Look, so that's that's the that's the shame, right? I was like, that is power. Like, what is that? And then I realized I had a connection with that because I was going through my own experience. I, I a couple of years ago I got um, my bariatric surgery because um, I was really worried about getting diabetes, and diabetes is essentially solved. Um, you know, type two diabetes, which my whole family has, and my brother had just gotten diagnosed and he's two years older than me. And I was like, oh shit, I'm going to get type two diabetes. And my dad died of type two diabetes. It's like a real thing for me and my family. And I was like, wait, bariatric surgery solves that problem. I'm going to go do that. But it's considered a weight loss surgery. And there's so much shaming around it. Um, in particular, like fat friends of mine who I love and respect were like, oh, you're doing, you're cheating. You're doing the che like the cheating way of getting skinny. Um, by the way, doesn't make you skinny just as a side note. But like the point, the point is that I was like, like I was like a rabbit in, you know, whatever, like a deer in headlights. And I was like, oh my God, I'm super ashamed. I like, and I was like, I haven't felt ashamed of my fatness since high school or since like grad school or something like that. I've been so used to being a fat person. Um, but what I realized is that is that power it was the same power as the math shaming. And I was like, what's going on here? And why does it work so well? And what is at work here? And so that's why I started really thinking through like, what is shame and like, how does it trick, how do we get triggered by it? And what are we being, what, what kind of tricks are being played on us based on that power? And so I have this book called The Shame Machine. And the first, and to answer your question, finally, the first third of it is like, what I call punching down shame, examples of weaponized shaming of people who are told they have a choice and they did, they made the wrong choice. Typically they don't actually have a choice. I, so I talk about addiction shaming, fat shaming, um, poverty shaming, like everything is framed as like, you made the wrong choice and now you should be blamed for it. And all the money that's being made off of that. Like literally it's a industry. It's like the, the shame industrial complex. 
um, meritocracy shame, which is related to like the shame of being badly educated and the college industry is making money off of it. You're participating in that, Jonathan. The thir second third of my book is a new kind of what I call punching out shame, which is foisted on us by the designs of the social media, where we're just constantly triggered and outraged and shaming each other on social media um, for the profit of the social media companies like Facebook. And that's, they are the current weight watchers of that kind of shame. And then finally, the third kind of shame um, I talk about, which is, I would say the good shame, is like the punching up shame that happens, um, uh, you know, when you hold powerful people accountable. So, oh, just a second. Hi, I'm on a call. This is my phone, but just put it down here. Thank you. My dinner just arrived, guys. Um, punching up shame is when like people organize and like think about like apartheid in South Africa. Like that was like basically saying, hey, powerful people, you're doing it wrong. We're holding you accountable. We're gonna watch you. We want you to do better. You have a choice. And in this case, they actually do have a choice. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna ask you to do better. And that's what punching up shame is. And my like long story short, Jonathan, the goal is let's stop punching down. Let's push back, punch up. And how well do you think uh, punching up is working with the social media companies themselves? Is, that, is, it, is it promising to you for changes coming? Any? I think punching up to be effective has to get them where it hurts, which is to say the incentives. Mm -hmm. So we need better laws. But I do think that the public is becoming more aware of it, in part because of the social dilemma and movies like that. The Coded Bias movie that's coming out next what, month with Joy will be another example of that. Um, so I do think at least as a public knowledge campaign, we're, we're making progress. We haven't, we need a better Congress, a better Senate, we need a better president for it to actually make real headway. But I, I feel hopeful about that. Good. Well, I think it's um, about time for us to wrap up. It's been Great to, great to have you here. Um, such an energizing discussion. We were able to address almost all of the questions that we got. Great. Uh, hope, I hope everyone um, enjoyed uh, hearing, you, hearing you address their questions. Uh, it was a great opportunity. Um, yeah. Um, thanks to everyone um, for coming. Uh, thanks again to uh, Alex Clemens and Common Reading for helping us um, organize and promote the event um, and for choosing your book in the first place. <laughs> Thank you. I had nothing to do with, but I was glad to see when it happened. I said, oh, Kathy's, they chose I'm very glad about it too. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so again, thanks everyone for coming. Um, and thank you, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Nice thank to you see both you. Jonathan and Kathy. Thanks, Alex.